We are so glad you're joining us. We're going to give folks a minute to get in before we get started. But while people are joining, I'm about to open a poll so that you can let us know a little bit about yourself so we know who we're talking to. And feel free to select multiple options here. If you are new to data science, have worked with Datakind before, and maybe you've volunteered with Datakind and you're a social impact professional, um, all backgrounds welcome. We just would love to learn a little bit about you. And you can share in the chat if you um, fit in a different book that get, or if there's something else you want to share about yourself. Hello, hello, welcome. People are continuing to join, so we'll give one more minute. Please, as you are joining, answer our opening poll so we can get to know you a little bit. Welcome, great to see folks coming in and some, some answers in the chat. Um, in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and get started and then I'll close the poll in a little bit so that everyone can see your results. But so far, it looks like a lot of you are social impact professionals new to data science, which is awesome. We are so glad you're here. Uh, our speakers today can talk about getting started with data science. So that's, that's the perfect fit. Glad to hear you. Welcome to non-data stakeholder engagement. This session is part of our program called Nonprofit Data 101, where we're focused on building capacity for doing data science in the social sector and nonprofit space. So we have these one hour webinars on data science topics. This is just one of many that we've done. And we also uh, have consultations afterwards for you to talk to data kind. Um, but who is DataKind? We are a nonprofit that helps mission driven organizations like the ones you all work at and unlock their data science potential ethically and responsibly. And we team technical data science experts. We are technical translators who can speak the social impact space language as well as the data science language. So we bring those data experts to social impact professionals regardless of their technical skills and collaboratively design and build data solutions to tough social challenges. And so for the next hour, we're going to focus on these learning objectives in which you, by the end of this time, will understand uh, why the best practices I've listed here matter and see examples of how three different social impact organizations have used these best practices in their data work and hopefully start to brainstorm how you can apply them to your work. So what are those best practices that uh, we're going to be talking about? First, we want to design different types of engagement strategies for different types of stakeholders, whether it's a leadership level stakeholder uh, to the implementing person on the ground. We also want to incorporate different strategies for using qualitative methods and conversations with end users, which are things you're probably be all familiar with, and, and that needs to complement the quantitative, uh, the quantitative information in that data-driven decision-making. Next, we really think it's essential to cultivate ambassadors and allies, which you'll get to hear about shortly. And these folks will really support and promote development, the development of your data work. One, one way to really get started for those who are brand new is to conduct a successful budget-friendly pilot projects. And that can help build buy-in for, for deeper investment at your organization for more follow-up data work. We also think it's helpful to take advantage of partnerships. A lot of people on this call have used different partners to build capacity. Uh, you don't have to do this alone. Don't be intimidated. There's a lot of uh, different folks who can partner with you and help you. Next, we really wanna iterate in that stakeholder engagement. Don't think that just because you reached out to someone one time, that will be sufficient. We need to iterate to ensure you've captured insights really accurately and fully. And finally, 
it's essential. We all agree uh, that it's essential for non-data stakeholder engagement to focus on enhancing your mission with outcomes focused projects so that you can connect the data work to the difference that it is making at your organization. Um, and that will be important in your project design and in your communication in alignment with those mission and outcomes. So at DataKind, we incorporate all of these practices into our work. These are our six core high-level components that you see on the screen that we believe are needed for high-impact data science projects. And actually about half of them are stakeholders. So clearly we think this topic is very important. We partner with prospective partners and stakeholders who might not have data science knowledge or experience. Um, but there are social actors who are working on the ground and who know the ins and outs of how this work is done. And then we pair that with understanding of the broader sector landscape and working with subject matter experts and people who really know their topics well. And then, of course, we bring data scientists, experts in their domain and the type of data work that they do. So now for the rest of this time, we'll be hearing about those social actors and social subject matter experts and how they do non-data stakeholder engagement. So let me introduce you to them. Um, Ishwari Shwaran is the Director of Product Incubation at Jobs for the Future, and he'll be sharing about their data journey. Dr. Sarah Little is the Head of Quality Assurance at Jacaranda Health in Nairobi, Kenya, and she will be sharing about a project engaging and users over and over again. And Monica Owens Doyle is the National Program Manager of Community Preparedness and Resilience Services at American Red Cross and is uh, on the ground expert on, um, on running American Red Cross's home fire work and has some really great stories of piloting a project and building buy-in with a lot of different stakeholders there. So I'm excited for this agenda. You'll get to hear about how to engage leaders and ambassadors with that outcome focused work to transform an organization at Jobs for the Future, how to iterate and gather user feedback and qualitative insights to build buy-in at Jacaranda Health, and how American Red Cross used a pilot project to build partnerships and grow internal capacity. We'll have lots of time for questions. So please, please, please share your questions in the Q&A feature as we go. And we'll close by sharing some resources. And um, I'm ending the poll so that you can all see the results. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ishwar. Thank you, Rachel. Um, hey, everyone. I am actually delighted to be here with you all. My name is Ishwar Ishwaran, and I lead uh, product incubation at JFF, which is Jobs to the Future. And I wanna start off by expressing gratitude to DataKind for extending this invitation to me and giving me the opportunity to share uh, insights from my journey and, and experiences on non-data stakeholder engagement. And I also wanna kind of, kind of uh, I'm happy to be here with fellow panelists, uh, Monica and Sarah here as well. So before we get into the topic, let me introduce you and provide you some background on what Jobs for the Future is. This is gonna take about 30 seconds there, and I wanna make it quick. So folks who are new to what JFF is, you have a better appreciation of why we did uh, what we did. So JFF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to making a difference in the American workforce and education sectors. Our goal is to drive positive change and promote equitable economic advancement for all. And we've been here for 40 years. We started off at Connecticut initially before becoming a national nonprofit. We have our headquarters in Boston and we have offices in DC and are, we, are about, we are now close to 400 strong. Um, and we have folks working remotely all over in all 50 states of the United States. And our work spans across various entities, including federal, state agencies, community colleges, educational institutions, community-based organizations, other nonprofits, employers, policymakers, and others. And recently we had our annual summit where we announced our next 10 year North Star, which is to assist 75 million people who face systemic barriers in attaining good quality jobs within the next 10 years. And to achieve this, we have two arms to the operation. So one is JFF itself and the other one is JFF Labs. So the quick difference between the two, so you can look at JFF as more a microscopic uh, viewpoint where we, JFF goes kind of deep diving into the challenges and face, challenges faced by individuals and systems. And the, on the other hand, JFF Labs, you can look at it as a, as a telescopic organization where we are 
exploring new and innovative approaches to some of the most complex issues in education and workforce that are emerging and the new trends that you're seeing over horizon. But both JFF and JFF Labs work hand in hand. So we are united in pursuing the same mission in addressing the obstacles of economic advancements that students, workers, businesses, and systems encounter. Now that you have an understanding of our organization, let's move forward and explore the case study of our data journey. And the data function was initially incubated within labs before making its way into JFF. So in the next few minutes, I'll walk you folks through our data journey and jobs of the future. And it all started in 2020 when I joined JFF. Uh, our data function has undergone significant changes to get to where it is today. And we will explore the key milestones and lessons learned along the way. So let's just dive right in. And in 2020, the country faced a series of crises and, and COVID and healthcare and racial equity. And, and the results of that, a uh, lot of organizations bore the brunt of it, struggling to cope with the immense expectations of it. And in the face of these multiple crises, ranging from all the issues that I mentioned, including racial equity, economic struggles, uh, social sector found themselves under immense pressure and they were grappling with high expectations and an urgent need for swift action. So what did we do then after we received all these first signals? First, how could we leverage the power of data and data-driven solutions to accelerate our impact? The potential for data to drive positive change and efficiency was evident, and we knew we had to harness it effectively. The second was we were determined to bridge the gap between the challenges we faced and the solutions we sought. And it was essential that we find innovative ways to kind of address the, the pressing issues that were in front of us. And thirdly, we recognized the need to break free from limitations of decades old legacy capacity and capability. We wanted to embrace new technologies and approaches. And finally, raising the level of data maturity and literacy within our organization became a top priority. Building a data savvy culture would empower our teams to make informed decisions and achieve even greater impact. So listening intently to these market signals, we embarked on a transformative journey and we saw data as a powerful ally and a mission accelerator. Excuse me. So key milestones that we did in the initial years. Um, firstly, we established a dedicated data services team within labs, laying the foundation for our data-driven initiatives. Next, we kicked off a pilot initiative aimed at assisting workforce agencies in states and communities. The objective of that was to promote evidence-based decision-making through data-driven approaches. And collaborating, we collaborated with seven state agencies across the board, uh, helping them in this new journey that they were planning to take. At the same time, we also recognize the importance of investing in infrastructure. So conducting an internal data maturity survey, we gained valuable insights that guided our progress. Uh, we focused on enhancing data collaboration among various teams and talent pockets within the organization's different silos. Um, but it was important that securing leadership buy-in was critical and critical aspect of what we wanted to do. So we took the time to communicate our vision and demonstrate the potential of data-driven strategies. In addition to garnering support from the top, we also worked diligently to kind of build grassroots level support. So this groundswell of support and backing at all levels of organizations ensured that our efforts were inclusive, unified, and effective. So for us, these milestones were the stepping stones to success, uh, driving us closer and closer to our mission and aspirations. And each accomplishment brought us closer to becoming a data-driven and impactful organization within the education and workforce and development sector. And this was a momentum that helped us move towards a more data-informed future. All right, so how did we articulate our data ambition? So let's take a closer look at that and how we kind of did this buy-in from our leadership and external partners. And to achieve true ambition in this space, we recognize the importance of building partnerships with organizations that share our vision and values. So we emphasize the power of co-creation, understanding that innovative solutions arise from collaborative efforts. DataKind is one of an organization that we reached out to, and we're really happy and proud that we have a long-standing partnership with DataKind. And by working with the partners and leveraging their own strengths and perspectives, we could drive collective impact. 
We also knew that building a strong foundation internally was crucial, so we prioritized developing our capacity and capability and fostering a data-driven culture within our own organization. And with these partnerships, co-creation, internal empowerment, our guiding principles, we set out our journey to realize our data ambition. So as a result, we reorganized ourselves. So we used to be called data services before, and now we were shifting from being a supportive role to a more leading role, or lead, to a more leading role. All right, so to align us with our new direction that we were taking, we changed our own mission, but also kind of did a renaming as well. So we were called data services before, now we, are called lead, we were called lead, which stands for leading economic advancement through data. And our vision was we aim to drive through data-driven transformation, how did we, and, and how did we make Make that happen. We started by identifying gaps and opportunities, amplifying what data-driven solutions were, and our approach, is, approach was rooted in coalition building and co-creation. And, and this look on these milestones, you see we collaborated very effectively with our program units, kind of enabling them to undertake work with substantial data requirements that they wouldn't have managed before. And the, the, we diligently built our portfolio of offerings, ensuring that we were well known both internally and externally. So, so lead kind of became a go-to team for ideation, conceptualization, incubation, partnership, delivery, and so on and so forth. And we, all these accomplishments kind of put us in a, in a, in a position where when there was an organizational reorganization last year, our team and our portfolio was moved and graduated to its mothership, kind of was a testimony to our growth and influence. All right, so where are we today? Um, so in labs right now, we've reimagined our role, moving from just a leading role to a more ambitious market-making role. So we've taken a significant step by establishing an incubation function for products. This marks the beginning of a new journey for us where we aim to nurture disruptive technology-driven ideas and transform them into scalable, marketable products and solutions. It's a new muscle that we're growing, and we kind of are initially focusing on climate innovation, lifelong learning, and job quality, and we plan on expanding that uh, soon. And if you want to learn more about it, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to have more conversations around it. All right, so I know this was quick, fast, and a lot, and I know we have a Q&A session, but I, what I also wanted to do was to kind of summarize this uh, into a kind of a summary slide. So, so creating strong alliances and ambassadors is crucial for success as you saw. And you want people who share your vision, who will speak your language at the right time. So build those allies and ambassadors. Second is listening is key. Understanding their challenges, their market insights and perspectives is important. And I personally have learned a lot from talking to people than any case study or article could have helped me. Um, you got to empower your allies with clear messages that they can share. So you've got to be repetitive about it. And repetition is vital to drive home the message. And importantly, go the extra mile. Offer brainstorming sessions, co-creation platforms, support beyond project needs. When they feel the ownership, they will be even more interested in, in what you have to offer. Also, don't forget to regularly to connect regularly with your aligned networks in the organization. So we started the data collaboration network, which is very, very valuable when pitching leadership for infrastructure investments. And by establishing strong allies and ambassadors, you will create a powerful network of advocates to champion your cause and drive positive change. And the final slide I have here is to answer this question is, how do you answer the question of how can we help you, right? So it's essential that you do your own homework and be prepared to answer that question. So you've got to remember everyone in the organization is rowing in the same direction and to accelerate their impact, you must clearly articulate how you can support their goals. So as data professionals, we need to step out of our own world and understand the subject matter. And the more we grasp their world, the more successful we become. And it's a challenge, I know, but it's worth it. For instance, I've asked to, to observe program units, uh, team meetings, I've listened in on client and funder meetings, I've encouraged my team to present at various gatherings internally, externally, which kind of has helped us arm ourselves with knowledge to better support the cause. So let's do whatever it takes to understand their needs and help them succeed. It's a win-win for all involved. Thank you.
Um, yeah, thank you, Ishwar. That was super interesting. Um, and I can move on just for the sake of time to the next case study, which is for Jacaranda Health. Um, yeah, just as a bit of context, um, again, I'm Sarah Little. I am a clinician by background, so not a data scientist, but um, I think it's super helpful to have lots of insight from different and various um, backgrounds to be able to use data to make data-driven decisions. And so being a clinician has really helped our organization um, to push this forward. Um, so I am, um, again, from Jacaranda Health, which is a social nonprofit based in Kenya. And our aim as an organization is really to improve um, the health care that both moms and babies receive at and around the time of childbirth. Um, so yeah, just as a little bit of context and background. So in the recent past, there's been a huge push within the pub public health kind of landscape overall to get moms into hospitals to deliver with skilled birth attendants. Um, in the past, we really felt that there was um, a huge a huge lack of healthcare, specifically because moms were not getting to skilled birth attendants um, in low resource settings specifically. But actually, over the past 10 years, we have seen that moms actually are going to hospitals and other healthcare facilities to deliver their babies. Um, and this has been an incredible area of improvement, but moms are still dying because there's a consistent quality of care gap once they actually get into the facilities. And we've realized over um, a period of time that this really needs to be addressed, this quality of care bag, quality of care gap. So we've, um, you know, lots of people have done extensive research, and we know that the majority of maternal and newborn deaths are largely preventable through improved quality of care. Um, so making sure that the skilled birth attendants are actually trained appropriately and have the correct knowledge and skills to be able to care for moms once they actually get into the hospital. So by applying the right type of care at the right time and at the right place, we really feel that this, this can be addressed. Um, so at Jacaranda Health, we, again, we aim to address the aforementioned challenge. So just making sure that the quality of care um, is actually as robust as it can be once moms actually get into healthcare facilities. And we partner with local governments to deploy sustainable and scalable solutions so that we can improve the way that moms both seek care during pregnancy and the way that they're cared for once they arrive at the hospital. So at Jacaranda Health, we envision a world where all moms are treated with respect, that they can experience safe childbirth and where their babies get a safe start in life. So this is just a little bit of background about our organization at large. Um, one of the ways that we do this is through a program called PROMS. So PROMS stands for Promoting Mothers During Pregnancy and Postpartum Through SMS. So what, what PROMS is, is a um, healthcare messaging platform. It began, uh, it began as an outgoing messaging platform where we inform moms about danger signs during pregnancy. This helps them to seek care at the right time during their pregnancy. And what we found is that once we start sending moms messages about their own healthcare journey, that they wanted to ask questions as well. So this quickly adapted to a two-way platform where moms can both um, receive messages and ask questions. And very importantly for this discussion, um, they can answer questions about the quality of care that they received once they went to a healthcare facility. So we, be we began collecting data on which services that she had been offered or not offered at every single ANC appointment that she went to and during her intrapartum care. So for example, we collect data on whether or not she was treated with respect when she went in for her ANC appointment or her antenatal care appointment. We, we collect data on which immunizations were offered and available to her child, um, whether or not her blood pressure and other vital signs were checked, um, whether or not she received counseling about nutrition and other pregnancy-related danger signs. Um, and we were collecting this data for an extensive period of time, and yet we weren't really sharing this data um, with any of our key stakeholders. Um, so we, we kind of came together as a team and realized that we had this huge collection of data, but because we weren't sharing it, nothing really was being actioned in terms of improving the healthcare for moms and babies. So we um, we needed to figure out the best way of going about this. 
So initially what we did was get together and just create a PowerPoint template. And we shared this with our stakeholders and it looked really similar to the to what you see on this slide, but it was just a PowerPoint. And we were going to start by just emailing these things to our stakeholders. Um, what, we, what we very quickly realized is that um, not all of the data that we were collecting was important for our stakeholders. So we shared this with the stakeholders and quickly realized that a real-time dashboard so that they could see ongoing data and kind of updated data over time was a better sharing method. So we transitioned from sharing PowerPoints through emails to a live dashboard and figuring out who the, who we needed to share this with and how frequently we needed to share and specifically what data was important for our stakeholders. So we need to make sure that um, that the dashboard that we were sharing was automated so that it was an, you know, a lighter lift for our team. Um, and this would make sure that it was sustainable. We needed to make sure that it was standardized and incorporated all of the information that our stakeholders wanted to see that was important for both them and us. And we needed to make sure that it was shared with multiple stakeholders all at once. We don't just want, we, sorry, I should have said this in the beginning, but Jacaranda Health works in um, 20 counties in Kenya. So it's not just one county or a small subset of stakeholders, but so many stakeholders. And so we needed to make sure that this was a process that was both sustainable and scalable as we move into new counties. So the process that we used um, was quite extensive. So number the first thing that we did was just determine what data that we wanted to share and with who. So we had to identify stakeholders both at a facility level, at a sub-county level, and a county level. This meant going to the counties themselves and asking um, nurse in charges and the county health management team exactly who the right person was to receive this data. Um, and then we had to determine how it should be presented. So, you know, the idea behind this dashboard and this data that we're sharing is that we want, that we wanted it to be um, like, you know, obviously shareable. So we needed to be able to share it. We also need our stakeholders to be able to interpret it. And then we want them to be able to easily action this. So a good example of an action point is if they realize, if stakeholders realize that, um, and this is an actual example. So if stakeholders realize that at the facilities, when moms are coming in for care, they are receiving um, their blood pressure, they're getting their blood pressure checked, the fetal heart rate is getting checked, but the counseling aspect was very, very um, low. So they weren't getting their, their danger signs discussed and nutrition was not being discussed with moms. Then they could action this by increasing the training specifically for their ANC care providers regarding um, the proper and appropriate ANC care. So again, we needed to determine how this was going to be presented, whether or not it was going to be through our live dashboard, that kind of thing. Um, and then the next thing that we did was conject or conduct FGDs or focus group discussions with our key stakeholders. So we had groups where we actually presented the dashboard, and then we basically went through a series of questions. What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? What do you see from this um, sample data? What would you do to action this data? And then we created a new dashboard based on that feedback. I think we went into this process expecting that there would be a little bit of feedback. And in fact, there was a ton of feedback. And it was super, super helpful to hear from the stakeholder perspective how exactly they wanted to see this data and how they would use that. Um, and then we did this again. So we changed the dashboard and then we went back to our stakeholders and said, again, does this look more in line with how you would want the, the data to be presented to you? Again, how would you action this data? What would you do? How would you interpret this data? Um, and then we again changed the dashboard to incorporate that data. So we did this a couple of different times and really um, collaborated with our stakeholders to iterate our dashboard so that it was really useful for them. And now we have a final product where um, it is delivered to them on a monthly basis and it incorporates pretty much all of the feedback that we gathered through these focus group discussions. Um, we are able to track on the background how many stakeholders are opening the dashboards on a monthly basis, how long they look at it. And then we have a tool that we're using to um, determine actionability based on the data that we're sharing with them. Um, the last thing that we did, which I think is really important, is that once we once we conducted all of these focus group discussions, we did not just assume 
that the stakeholders then had a good grasp of how to read this dashboard, we actually had a large sensitization meeting with all of our stakeholders to sensitize them on exactly how to read it, how we expect them to look at it, and um, and, and you know how we expect them to interpret it, and then how they could use it, what an opportunity it would be to actually use this data to improve their healthcare facilities, both from a training perspective, financially, all of these things. And so we gave them some ideas about how they can use this data. Um, so this is a relatively recent process. We just started sharing this data with stakeholders approximately three months ago. Um, and so over time, we will see over this next year or so how they're using this data. And again, I think that all of us understand that that will iterate this even further. We really want this to be something where they can use this data and action it on an ongoing basis. And so I think that all of us understand that there will be probably several other iterations before we perfect the process, but so far the feedback has been really great. Um, yeah, regarding the shareability of it. So yeah, that's where I wanted to leave it today. Y'all, um, I'm really excited to be here today to share a little bit about our American Red Cross Home Fire Risk Map Project and how this effort is leading to, to improvements for buy-in for data-related projects that support our mission service delivery. Um, Y'all probably have heard of the American Red Cross or of your local um, National Society Federation member in your local country. I started working for this over 140-year-old organization more than 15 years ago. And when I began this work, preparedness looked fundamentally much differently than it does today. So the, the picture at the top right you're seeing here is what we call a tear sheet. And I used to go out to public events and I take these tear sheets. There's, you pick your name of your disaster and your topic and we have a legal size, large printed um, piece of paper with tiny micro font that's printed um, with English language on one side, Spanish or another language on the flip side. And it's written at a very technical level, um, sometimes at a collegiate level, and it creates a really hard uh, way to deliver one-way education-only messaging. So when I was doing this work, I might go talk to 10,000 people in a weekend at the Black Sea Seafood Festival down in Mississippi about how to be ready for hurricanes. Did people even know what this content said? Did they understand it? Were the interactions meaningful? There was no real way to track outcomes. Like what were they doing with the information after they left my booth, then they went home? Was it going into a recycling bin? There was no real adaptation to account for needs beyond that simple language translation. So if you needed help processing information or understanding like what does it mean to make a plan to be prepared for a disaster, it was really hard to make that happen and understand the outcomes related to the program. So back in 2014, we were challenged by our new organizational leadership team to redesign how we do preparedness work at the Red Cross um, and how that could actually create a manageable benefit. Uh, and it's it's really fascinating being part of a rapid development project where you're told that you have a leadership mandate to execute on with less than two months lead time to do research to program launch, which was really, really intense. So the initial research led us to develop a project to tackle the reduction of home fire deaths and injuries and to focus on smoke alarm installations. Since we've launched the program back in October 2014, we've installed over 2.6 million smoke alarms in more than 1.1 million households in the U.S., including U.S. territories and tribal nations. Seven people die each day in home fires in the U.S. Most people don't realize that we see this many fatalities in the United States due to this issue. Uh, on average, we're looking at 2,500 to 3,500 people dying each year from this hazard. This is more than most other natural disasters combined. This issue has remained stagnant over the past several decades, and you're more likely to die today in a home fire than you were in 1980. There is some good news, though. Just having one working smoke alarm can cut your risk of death in a home fire by 50%. That's a huge improvement with a simple, relatively low-cost solution. At the launch of this large, national program with a constrained budget, which 100% of the budget was allocated toward actual supply and material purchases for the smoke alarms themselves. We had limited other resources. We had a very short lead time, like I mentioned just a moment ago. We knew we had to focus this effort in the right homes to make sure that it made the difference that our leadership team wanted to see. What we knew is that we had to get to the 23% of the homes with no working smoke alarms that have 60% of the home fire fatalities. 
we need a better resource. We needed a better resource than the top 25 zip code list per state that we'd received from our United States Fire Administration partners. It simply wasn't enough. So when we started reviewing the available data sets and information about fire fatalities, we began to understand the different risk factors that were listed here and how they converge and contributed deaths and home fires. Some of these factors like age are things that result in an exponential increase to your risk of death. The more risk factors a household has, the greater the likelihood someone will die at that location. During this exploration, we also learned that there are severe problems with the US fire data set. There is no centralized command structure in this nation that can compel fire departments to report thoroughly and consistently year over year. We had large pieces of the puzzle missing in certain communities, but we knew that there was still need present in those communities, even though their fire departments weren't reporting regularly. So how do we fill in these kind of critical gaps in knowledge on how to direct our program? When we started looking at this issue and building a solution, it was very important to have the short list of those key data elements that we needed to consider um, and analyze and winnow down to the, to the most impactful measures so that we could really drive the development of the key variables we wanted to look at from the American Community Survey. And just to kind of give you a frame of reference, this survey has over 100 variables to look at. So we, there's no way we could analyze all the data. We had to really think about what are the most critical aspects that the data model should look at to inform program operations. And fortunately, about this time, one of our teammates discovered Datakind DC, and we took our problems to this team of knowledgeable and eager volunteers who collaborated willingly with us and led the development of three different data models, one focused on fire propensity, one focused on poverty, and the, another focused on the risk of no working smoke alarm. Together, these models are used to create a composite risk score that allows us to quickly and easily compare across geographies and look at relative risk. So the image you see here on the right is a sample from our most recent um, home fire risk map project that we've been working on. At the high level here, the darker the red saturation color you see, the higher risk area um, that is gonna be for home fires. If you have ever been to Washington, DC, the east side of the city that is the darker red here is actually the most um, impoverished portions of the city. It abuts some very um, high risk areas in Maryland. And it's, it's a critical area of need for um, this type of service delivery. Actual int actionable intelligence is a phrase that we hear very frequently in our work in the humanitarian sector, but sometimes you have to stop and ask yourself, what is that? How do you really give people the type of data they need to make a really good decision on the ground? Uh, the product that Datakind project team built in partnership with us resulted in a very clear, easy to use graphical, information product that has a logical starting point. In this map, it, you can just you can see right off the bat, where do I need to go focus my effort? How am I gonna make the most difference? I, I'm gonna go to these darker shaded areas first and then continue to grow the program beyond those borders. And this really helps us pinpoint the most vulnerable households. Our, our program leads use this content to then decide where to start those implementation efforts, including how to identify local partners like fire departments to get their perspective and insights on the qualitative data to confirm what these quantitative data models present to us. We're able to have those conversations that talk about recently arrived immigrants coming from other countries that may not be familiar with our cooking or heating technologies in the US that are leading to really dangerous fires. Uh, pairing this knowledge together really has presented us with the opportunity to, to make a more impactful position around this issue. It also provides us with the, the ability to, to engage with fire department partners and learn about their prevention efforts that they've been working on, their local experience running calls, and seeing severe fire in their community. In, in sum, really we wanna know, does the model stack up with what your operational experience is on the ground? And if it does, that tells us, hey, we're looking at the right places. Uh, next, our teams engage other community gatekeepers from local organizations and faith-based groups that help us get the doors op open to the program. So working in the nonprofit sector, I will say one of the biggest challenges I think I faced throughout my career working in the sector is that it's always easy to get donors to fund things like the smoke alarms, the tangible aspects of delivering that humanitarian mission. People want to buy those. They want to buy the accessible fire safety equipment that helps our, our neighbors that are deaf or hard of hearing be able to get egress warnings that they need to escape their home in a timely fashion. 
it's much, much harder to secure investments in things like tech infrastructure to operate a program or the tools to help improve the efficiency of the program. The, this project was really, from my perspective, was built out of necessity in the, in the view of the program team. And it was done as a pilot project to see if we could get better results by leveraging data in new ways to direct our limited resources. The results have been very compelling so far. This project won a top 40 tech innovations award from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies this year. And we're using this project as an experience as a best practice case study internally of how our organization can leverage data projects to better serve the humanitarian mission. It's been included in new Red Cross data literacy trainings for all team members that are gonna be launching this year. Uh, in addition to that, we've also included it in leadership data trainings to help our leaders understand how to use data science in a way that can really um, fundamentally change how we deliver our mission. Without this kind of ability to pinpoint exactly where we needed to go with the program, we would not see the results that we've seen so far. It's really important to be able to understand how we can leverage, uh, leverage other products to be able to, to Im improve our mission work. We're really, um, recently we were able to hire in a new team member who was a data kind volunteer that was leading our project. And he is now working on our machine learning team at the Red Cross. And so he's able to carry forward this project as kind of that best practice case study and to help everybody understand, you know, what are the, what are the things that you can do? What is possible? You know, how can we make a bigger difference than what we're already doing? And sometimes change with a 140 year old plus organization takes a lot of time and a lot of evidence to affect. So with stakeholder engagement, um, we, we engage our stakeholders in different ways with this project, right? For our implementers, the people that on the boots on the ground doing the work in the field, our fire to fire partners, um, it took a lot of like knowledge around how does this tool work? What data is it considering? What are the key risk factors that it's calculating models off of? Does it really stack up against their local experience? Having those individual conversations. We also engaged our uh, fire department partners and community-based organizations to help them understand the methodology. Um, and we actually did iterative review processes with them to have early buy-in and input to the process. So they're more likely to trust the tool as we launched it and use it, right? We also wanted our implementers to understand, you don't need to recreate the wheel. This has already been done for you. Don't go build another map, charge more money to an organization using all these other data, data projects and enterprise feature services that you can pull together because it's quite costly. And we've put a lot of really good thought into this product. And with our senior leaders engaging them, it was really important for us to help them understand how does this benefit the Red Cross mission? How does this better serve our clients? How does this help us create the shift from equitable service delivery really to focusing on equity and going to the places where people need this service the most and they can't afford their own SNP alarms? And then, you know, we want to frame up for them. What are the key outcomes and how does it matter? Why is it relevant to the community? So I love this tool. I could clearly talk about it all day long. I love DataKind. I love the partnership we built together because really this is what has enabled our program to be so, so successful and to help us you know, move the needle on this key issue in the United States. We don't see this as being an issue because it happens in ones and twos across the nation in small neighborhoods. It doesn't get the media attention that a Hurricane Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, a Hurricane Harvey gets. Um, so we so far through this program have saved 1,893 lives that we know of, that we've documented. So these are people that experienced the fire after they had the preparedness intervention. And these are the outcomes. The, the map you see on the top right is a map of locations and numbers of saves in specific locations and areas. Uh, the, the image on the bottom left here is a home fire that happened in Schenectady, New York in December, 2022, where we had 10 family members escape that structure um, because of the smoke alarms that were installed. The gentleman featured down here on the lower right this is Mr. Gilbert from New Orleans, Louisiana, and his home caught on fire after smoke alarms were installed in his property, and he was able to escape this, this fire and, and live, you know, and he's now championing the, the, the call to action for folks to get their homes protected. This tool really is our, our program's North Star. It's how I refer to it. It guides us to exactly where we need to intentionally intervene with the service to create these life-saving results. And being able to tell these kind of stories about the outcomes of the product and how it helps 
and demonstrating things like the fact that this map of the lives saved actually overlays quite nicely with the map of the pinpointed locations where the, um, the risk map is telling us to go serve, right? It's telling us these are the most at-risk locations and then that's where we're seeing the most saves. And so it's a very beautiful thing. And so these, these results have really captured the attention of leaders both internal to the Red Cross and also externally in our partner agencies like the US Fire Administration and well as well with you know garnering interest from our local fire to fire partners. And this tool is available, I just want to let y'all know, for anyone to use free of charge, you can find the current version that's posted simply by entering home fire risk map in your search engine. And the final updates that we're working on right now to the most recent iteration of the project, including the updated mapping interface are slated for release this fall. So really excited about this, would love to connect more and talk more about it with anyone that's interested, but I'll hand it back over to Rachel, thanks. Wow, I learned, I already knew what all three of you were going to talk about, but I have learned so much um, still in this time. Thank you so much. We have so many questions, um, so we'll dive right in. Um, one that came through is, that would be great to hear from any of you is, which roles or tasks are a must to make sure we're going to build a good data-driven environment? I think you've all touched on that in your presentations, but maybe we can go in and each of you share like one thing that is that big must for, for a role or a task. Um, Ishwar, can I put you on the spot to go first? Uh, sure, and I've been thinking about it because every role seems important, but I, I would, um, and it depends on the organization, of course. The way we started off was, uh, I wouldn't, we needed someone to play a data evangelist role, someone who's able to kind of do the relationship building and convincing people because at the end of the day, if you really want to build something, you need to be able to convince uh, folks. You need someone to be able to talk to that. So everything else, once you do the talking, your every, every other role can easily be budgeted and hired. But my my take is that uh, that you have to have someone who's able to kind of articulate your vision, connect the dots between need and what data can do for you, uh, and then everything else should fall in place. I yeah. can maybe piggyback on that if that's okay, Ishwar. I, I think that that's super important to have kind of a data evangelist, and I think as a um, an extension of that, just having this collaborative process, like what we realized is that data that's important to me is not necessarily always important to our stakeholders. So really listening and having this collaborative process of understanding what data is most important for them and then being able to present it in the right way so that they can actually interpret it is, is also super important. So having that evangelist, but also understanding and bridging that gap of what is important to who, I think is also a really key. I think for me, really coming at it from this the humanitarian sector, it's helping people understand and being able to tie in, like what are the key, key ways in which this project, the desired outcome is going to help support you know, the mission, what are you trying to drive and affect change around and having some of the groundwork done prior to going to try to get buy-in from senior leaders, right? Because if you don't understand like what your goal is and what you're hoping to drive towards, even if you don't have the solution fully figured out, it's going to fall flat when you try to take it to the upper management folks. Um, so I, I really think it's important just to kind of frame the question, frame the issue, understand what the outcome is that you're driving toward. So true. Thanks, everyone. Let's focus on outcomes and get all of those stakeholders involved. Um, what I, I'd love to hear from each of you on what you've noticed is unique about building buy-in for a data project specifically. A lot of folks on our call today are new to data science, so they might have some experience with stakeholder engagement. But what was different in this data project than in a different type of project? Um, maybe we can go in the opposite order this time. Monica, do you want to start? <laughs> sure, I can start out. Um, so for us, our organization does not necessarily have a large core competency in data fluency, and like we're not used to using data in this kind of a way. So it was very new and different for us. And we were also new to this role of going into homes and installing smoke alarms, which has really been occupied previously by the fire service in large part. So we were a newcomer to both aspects. And so we had to kind of build on that you know, foundational knowledge of, you know, community-based research that's been done, like what are these key factors, right, and pulling this together and really doing this in a very tightrope walking kind of way and balancing our newness to the environment with our, our seeking to improve the environment 
and talking with these stakeholders in a way that reflected that, yes, we respect your experience and we want to learn from you. And we also have some thoughts that we would also like to contribute in the space, right? So how do you how do you really merge these things together? And so for us, this was a, a very um, interesting project. We engaged our, our fire, fire service partners as SMEs to provide that feedback on the iterative design of the tool and testing of the models to say, does this resonate for you? And we tried to be very inclusive in that approach. And a lot of projects at the Red Cross are just handled more internally, you know, like a project management plan. I'm a, I'm a project management professional myself, you know, so it's usually more in-house, everything is done, boom, 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 you have the plan, you do the things. But this was like a lot more stakeholder buy-in and engagement. And it was a lot different because we were so new to both data and this, this job we were trying to go do. Um, I can go next. I, I, yeah, so what, what I thought was unique to our project this time is um, kind of different than what Monica was saying about her project. Our stakeholders really are used to using data already. Um, so those of you who are in kind of the health sphere, most countries have like a DHIS or a health information system that they already use. And so what, you know, approaching them to say, not that you shouldn't use that data, but you should also use our data, right? So we are collecting this data um, from moms. So it's being collected in a completely different way. And we're actually collecting, collecting different data points. And so to really convince people that they should not stop using the other data, but they should use our data as well in conjunction, which would allow them to make better decisions um, was a little bit of a challenge because it's almost like this, if it's not broken, why fix it kind of mentality. They've already had, they already have a data source that they've already been using. So it was really approaching stakeholders and convincing them in the beginning that the data that we're providing them is useful and can actually provide a different lens in how they can go about um, improving their healthcare facilities. So I think that was a little bit unique for us. And it just leaves me then. So um, first off, I I don't, I mean, not to ding the question, but uh, I, I wouldn't call my thing unique uh, in that sense because, you know, I've been around. I what I would never say that, but I, I said it just now. So I've been around and I can say that uh, it, it may feel unique, but there are a lot of cross learning, right? And why else would we be here? So um, so, so my engagement in, in, in this sphere kind of neatly falls into two, two buckets, right? There's the budget related discussions and then, then, then there's the programmatic alignment. So, and programmatic alignment, and there was a question somewhat related to that by Mark in the chat. And I'm, uh, I kind of gave a half -ish answer, but um, I'm happy to talk more about it. But uh, the programmatic alignment is a challenge and, you know, articulating the challenge um, is, is difficult and you need to be able to, uh, um, show how, say, I need to show how my team, for example, would work to help with the programmatic outcomes and impact as documented by and missioned by the other, the programmatic units. And for this, and I've said this before, we needed to, we need to listen, we need to understand, we need to read a lot, and you need to like, you know, come armed with a lot of information before you're able to propose good ideas and solutions. And and some teams that I've worked with had data enthusiasts and champions right in there who came with their own ideas, which is kind of a double-edged sword. On uh, Others came with grand visions of what they wanted accomplished, but either way, the answer is somewhere in the middle. And, um, and I honestly, I, I had to grow additional muscle to kind of, uh, that I never had, like, like on networking, diplomacy, relationship management, politicking. I mean, I know these are not data skills and your guys are wondering, like, what is he talking about? This is data 101. Trust me, I, I, I realize all other things can be learned, but this takes painful practice if you really want to be successful in meeting, in, in doing what you want to do. Uh, and the budget, on the other hand, is more a numbers game. I know it is it is more sciencey than artsy, but it does require a new it, for us, at least, it required a new perspective for how you looked at budgeting technology resources, which cannot be compared with the rest of the organization. So, so it, it took a few runs before we kind of landed on these numbers. So, um, my unique thing kind of is, is bracketed into these these big buckets for me. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Great, thanks. 
Um, we're very close to being out of time. So for one more question, we'll do a very, a speed round, um, but the question doesn't easily translate to a speed round. So this is a challenge. What is the biggest challenge when it comes to data collection? Um, do any of you want to volunteer? Do you have a quick answer? The biggest challenge that when it comes to data collection? I can go um, to start. I would say just, just looking at the volume of data out there and picking the most meaningful elements that you want to analyze and that you want to leverage for your project, right? It's like, there's so much breadth and so much depth and there's so many different directions you can go. And just trying to figure out the focal point, I think was the biggest challenge for us and trying to understand while, like, for example, if we looked, we looked at poverty because the color of your skin is not what makes you at risk, right? It, it's some of the other intersectional elements of your demographic profile that are creating that risk. Um, so it, it was really hard for us to kind of look at what is what are the key things that we want to laser lock in on and, and really drive the modeling work that we're doing. It's just like just trying to find, you know, the trees from the forest, right? <laughs> uh, that's the hardest thing for us. Yeah, my answer is defining your indicators. <laughs> yeah, that's a very succinct way to put it, Rachel. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to add, Rachel, if we have time. Okay. No, so uh, this is a very big question, and I and and our problems were slightly different. One is the absence of of robust data in the marketplace itself, right? I mean, we wanted like if you wanted to measure job quality, if you wanted to measure credential quality, if you want to measure climate impact on people movement or whatever, right? So these there are no ready-made data or even uh, constituent data sets, disaggregated data sets out, out there that can answer these quickly. Plus, we also found that there were a lot of gaps. I mean, most of the data that we collected or we expected external parties to collect was very, very dependent on a learner or a worker or somebody answering those questions. And in most times they would not answer any questions or it's difficult to keep in touch with them after they have left a training program, they've got a job and it's very difficult to get in touch with them. So there are these, these gaps. And the other one is of course, non-standardization, right? Everybody who collects data makes some assumptions. And you, you, when you kind of you know match these data together, you're like, uh, okay, how did they even get this data? So there is this methodology piece that's kind of non-standard across the board. And then there is, of course, the issue of, uh, you know, the volume and collection of this data and metrics piece of it as well. How, wh what do I, if I cannot, if I cannot predict how many people got a particular job in a particular sector, then comes the next piece, which is proxy. So, so what can, what proxies can I use to do this? So we've had a whole boatload of, of data collection issues and problems. Uh, and, I, and I can go on and on about, um, but not to say that it's, it's all uh, dark and gloomy. It's just that there are organizations and I'm seeing Red Cross, for example, and others who have already kind of made a lot of uh, headway in, in the direction. And a lot of organizations like data kind and others are kind of making headway. So, so it's both, it's a kind of a silver lining and a dark cloud kind of thing. Thanks, absolutely. Sarah, do you have a one sentence answer? What's most challenging? I think it's similar to Eshwar. I think that, you know, data is only ever going to be as good as the amount of people who give you that data. And so finding different and better ways to collect more robust data, because the first question that stakeholders are going to ask every time is like, I mean, at least in our case is like, how many moms gave you this information? So we can present this data, but they have to ask every single time, like who is giving you this data and how many people. And so the, the more data collection processes and ways that we can get more engagement from moms who are answering or, you know, from any data source, I think the better. Um, so that's been our biggest challenge. Absolutely. I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get more respondents, which is a great segue to we are about to send a survey to all of you participating today, and we'd love your response to get some input. But before that, I do want to briefly mention we have some resources that will be shared in the chat. Um, we've got some from Datakind, some from uh, that have been mentioned in the presentations, like the data maturity assessment from Ishwar and uh, others as well. So you can learn more about this topic. And these will also be in the follow-up email you'll get tomorrow. I'll go ahead and open the poll so that we can get a sense of um, how this experience was for you in this session. I know I certainly learned a lot. 
But as you're answering this poll, um, I'm just going to pull back up our best practices and learning objectives. And uh, hopefully we were able to uh, learn about how these different engagement strategies and qualitative data, ambassadors, partnerships, and iterating can be helpful through these three experiences. And finally, there's more if this was useful or not. If you'd like to follow up with office hours, um, we can connect one on one for 30 minutes. If you want to watch an event on data engineering or data infrastructure or scoping a project, we have all of that in our new YouTube playlist. Um, and then next we have a um, event on automated reporting with dashboards in August, which uh, Dr. Sarah Little gave a little bit of uh, information about what that looks like for her. And we'll have even more examples and tutorials in August. So please sign up for that uh, link in the chat as well. And finally, the survey, uh, please respond and uh, let us know what topics you wanna see, what you like about this, what you don't. Uh, we change this program every single month based on what comes through the survey. So I would love any insights that you have. And finally, you can, if you're not already, subscribe to our newsletter. That's where you get all the events, all the information about how to partner with us, uh, what's going on at Datakind at datakind.org slash subscribe. And I'll say a quick thank you and hope you all have a great rest of your day. I'm glad you all were able to learn from our event today and um, we'll see you next time. Thanks to our speakers.